Hello, welcome tonight. Sorry, that was a little embarrassing to notice that I had misspelled our key speaker tonight's name on the first slide. So sorry about that. Uh, so welcome. Uh, if you are expecting a class on from Keying with Natives, Basics of Plant Taxonomy, given by Deheims, you are in the right place. Um, I am Vivian New. I'm going to be your host tonight. And let's get started. What's going on here? Let me, there we go. Uh, first, we would like to acknowledge that the work done by the Santa Clara Valley Chapter of CNPS lies in the homeland of the Mwekma Ohlone, the Amamutsan Tribal Band, the Tamian Nation, and the Ramayatush Ohlone. We still live and thrive in this area today. We hope to learn from them and support their work to restore traditional practices and to heal from historical trauma. If this is your first talk with us, we would love to know how you found out about us and where you are. So if you're comfortable with that, please share it in chat. And uh, we are part of the California Native Plant Society with the Santa Clara Valley Chapter. If you are not currently a member and you're not familiar with the California Native Plant Society, we're a nonprofit environmental organization founded in 1965. We have over 10,000 members. Actually, I just heard today that we have over 11,000 members now in 35 chapters that are spread all over California and even beyond the country. We, we have a chapter in Baja, California. Our chapter, the Santa Clara Valley chapter, covers Santa Clara County and Southern San Mateo County. And our mission is to save California's native plants and their habitats by bringing together science, education, conservation, and gardening. We welcome your support. And if you're not currently a member, we would love to have you join us. In addition to supporting programs like this, um, your bene membership benefits would include uh, subscriptions to two, not just one, but two journals, Artemisia and Flora. Uh, one, Artemisia is a more scientifically oriented journal and Flora has a lot of wonderful general interest articles about native plants, amazing photography, wonderful, wonderful uh, journals, both of them. You'd also receive our Blazing Star chapter newsletter, which tells you about all our upcoming events and also has lots of interesting articles about local things. And you receive discounts at local nurseries and more. So if you're not currently a member and you'd like to join us, just go to cnps.org slash join, or there's a QR code on there. So if you do QR codes, you can point something at it and it'll take you to the page. We have uh, one more activity coming up in February. That's our photo photography group meeting uh, on February 25th. And that is for sharing pictures. So if you're a photographer and you have pictures to share, consider signing up to share pictures. And if you just enjoy looking at beautiful pictures of plants and hearing tips about photography, um, feel free to join. It's open to everybody. And you can find out more about it by going to our website, cnps-scd.org. Uh, we have other activities in the plans. But um, in particular, there's two things I wanted to point out. And at the beginning of April, our Going Native Garden Tour is going to be live again. So uh, go to gngt.org to register and find out more about it. Um, we are also going to be having an in-person wildflower show at the end of April, April 23rd at West Valley College. So save the date and check out our website for more information about it as plans solidify. Um, you can use either of those QR, QR codes because you can one of them will take you to our website and the other one will take you to our meetup group where we also put information about all of our upcoming events. Uh, our, a lot of our chapter is funded by our nursery, which is currently closed, but will we open on March 1st. We have an online store where you can buy your plants. That, that QR code uh, will take you to it. Uh, and you can, once you've purchased your plants, you can either have them delivered if you live between Belmont and San Jose, or you can pick them, schedule a pickup at our nursery. And in addition to plants, we have books and t-shirts and some other things. So, and we are always adding more plants. So if you don't think what you want in our online store, uh, just check back and you might be able to find it. If you are not currently on our chapter news mailing list, I would encourage you to join it. It's a Google group. The information is there at the bottom of the screen on 
the email address to send a message to join. You can also just go to our website, cnps-scb.org, and that will provide information on how to join. The great thing about the news group is you get email once a week, and it just tells you what's coming up. So it's a great way to find out what's going on with our chapter talks, uh, field trips, all of that. And we also try to include other information as well. So other chapters that are local that have um, events that we think might be of interest to you, we include those as well. So please think about signing up for our email group if you're not currently on it. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, please mute your microphones. If you have any questions for Dee during the, her uh, lecture, just type them into the chat. Doesn't matter if you're on YouTube or on Zoom. Uh, we will monitoring the chat in both places, and we will be reading all of those questions to Dee at the end of her lecture. Uh, we do expect to finish by 9 p.m. And this talk is being recorded on YouTube, so if you want to view it later, if you have to leave early, um, you can always go to our YouTube channel and see it there. And now I want to introduce Dee Himes. She is a current CNPS board member, our field trip chair. She's also a former chapter treasurer, a former field trip chair. She's an active weed warrior at Edgewood um, County Park and Preserve. She's an adjunct instructor of horticulture at Foothill College in their environmental horticulture and design program. And she is passionate about sharing her, uh, her teaching abilities with all of us. She's an amazing teacher. And I am going to turn it over to Dee now. Oh, let's see. Always no. Okay. How's that? It looks great. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Um, I just want to put out there, I'm not a professional taxonomist nor a professional botanist. I do this for fun, <laughs> believe it or not. But it really helps me um, look at plants out um, when I'm photographing and trying to learn the plants that I'm looking at. So tonight's class is um, basic taxonomy and what is taxonomy? So, so it really boils down to it's a systematic classification of living organisms. It could be um, not only plants, but animals, um, any living organisms um, uses this type of system to give them a name. Um, humans like to classify everything. Everything likes to, uh, humans like to put things in bucket. And it's a way for them to learn about the world around them, to protect them from harm, as well as for use of healing or for warfare or for harming other people or for hunting and things like that. So um, it really helps us manage a world in some sense of order. So today's basic lesson um, I do advise, it, um, since this is recorded, you don't really have to madly take notes or, any, or, or anything like that. Just enjoy the lesson and hear everything out. You can always repeat it and then make notes later on. So today's lesson, we're going to uh, kind of go through uh, what uh, the, there's a wrong spelling, phy phylogenetic tree of life. There's some typo there. And uh, what is the taxonomic classification system? Uh, we're going to look at a bit of the Jepsum e-flora, the California flora uh, phylogenetic index. Uh, we're going to look at eight plant families, um, basics with plant samples. And this is done through uh, botany in a day. And we're going to have a little understand basic information on the binomial nomenclature, how, how things are named and the reason behind some of the naming. And then just enough information to get you curious and explore and take a closer look at your observations. All right, so what is the phylogenetic tree of life? It's basically... Uh, like I said before, it tells you the tree of life of all organisms, living organisms. So basically, it, we start off with the domain, which is the bacteria and ar archaea and um, eukary eukaryota. 
So um, just let you out know out there, some of the words I cannot pronounce. It's Greek, Latin, and English is my second language, if you don't believe that. So he, uh, forgive my mispronunciation. Um, anyways, so uh, with the domain, we we'll also look at the kingdom. And our kingdom is basically dealing with the plant wall, the plant plant A, as they call it. And here's the taxonomy tree for plant kingdom. Basically, plants sit up on top. This is our world currently in terms of botany. And things are classified in different um, sections. You've got uh, plants that don't make seeds and they're split up into different categories. One, algae, mosses, and ferns. You've got the gymnosperm, which are the non-flowering, or I should say the naked um, seed uh, category. And then you've got the angiosperms, which are the flowering plants. This is very a simple, basic structure. It's not really um, the, um, you know, in-depth in, um, categorization of what the botanists actually learn. But this is something to give you to get you started on looking at things and putting things in buckets. So this is a taxonomical classification for corn. So as you can see, the domain is Eukarya or Eukaryota. And then we have our kingdom, which is um, the plantae kingdom, and then the phylum or division. This is basically what we look at in terms of plant identif identification. And there's class, order, but those are really more for the true but botanists and taxonomists that go through all these uh, different classes to figure out what plants they're looking at or discovering. And then we go into the family, genus, and species. And this is where um, plant identification comes into play. It is very important to know the family, and by knowing the family, you get to understand um, how things go into the genus and the species. All right, the general classification system. So what's that? So we have, like I said in the drawing, we have the domain, which is basically all plants, uh, all cell-based organisms containing nuclei or membrane-bound organelles. You don't have to understand any of this. You can Google that later on if you're really interested in that part of the um, classification system. We're dealing with the plant kingdom. And then the phylum and division. This is what our world kind of um, breaks up into. You've got the algae, you've got the bryophytes, the ferns, the club moss, and the naked seeds, which are the gymnosperms, and the angiosperms, which are the flowering plants. Uh, and Jetson breaks it down more further, and uh, uh, there's a diagram that I'll be showing you then. And then the class, the order, and then the families, genus, and species. So that's the basic structure of classifying um, plants. And, and these are the sections that we deal with. All right, so. So where do we begin? So to understand um, how to classify or to find out what plant you're looking at, you do need to understand what is a monocot or a eudicot. So monocot, so cot, they shorten the, the word, it, cot is cotyledon, which I'll explain later, but this is how the word is dissected. So you've got the monocot, which is one cotyledon, you, it, means true and die is two do so true to do time less true to die caught so it just means and here's the breakdown of what it means the monocotyledon is a single cotyledon which mainly are the um, grasses and the lilies um, those type of uh, plants that are classified in the monocot so how is that understood? So cotyledon is a part of the plant that is 
stores some energy to help the plant actually germinate. And that's part of the cotyledon. That's for the grasses and the lilies. And then the eudicot cotyledon is um, when you um, eat, um, was it Be bean sprout? Those little wingy things at the end of um, the um, the uh, what is it? The um, uh, bean uh, bean sprout um, is the cotyledon that's uh, hanging on to the st uh, stem of the the root, and that's these two little appendages so i'm sure you um when you guys were kids in kindergarten you germinated seeds and um you probably learned that in um i, I wouldn't say kindergarten, maybe in grade school i'll say and then here's the cotyledon um when it when the plant has germinated and these are those little wrinkly things in your peas and then the the first leaves that sh come up um, so this or um, this or this part of the plant helps gives it energy for the shoot to come up to germinate, and then when the leaves come up and able and are able to fo to do photosynthesis, all this starts to wrinkle out and gets used up and it drops off eventually. All right, so here's the um, Jepson E flora, the uh, California flora phyl phylogenetic index. So. This can be found on um, the eFlora, and if you click on this link, this link right here um, it will take you to the website. I'm going to try this link because I had some trouble with it earlier today. Um, I may have to go out and come back in, but we'll go through that. And it brings you, these are all live links to all, all the different, um, different categories and different things. I'm going to try and get back. Does it work? Yes, it works. So... The phylum and division for our uh, California flora basically deals have these uh, divisions: lycophytes, uh, which are the club moss, ferns, gymnosperms, aquatic plants. I'm not going to try and say that. Magnolia, magno, magnoliids, and also hornworts, eudicots, and monocots. And I've actually, you could ignore the naturalize. Anyway, um, so this translate in graph in in um, dichotomous key like that. Um, so that's how it's laid out. So you see the branching, and then you have different families on that side. You've got the fern. That's all the fern families. Gymnosperm. There's only four species, uh, no, four families in the California flora that um, are in uh, in the germ, germ, uh, gymnosperm section. And then you've got the um, aquatic plants, magnoliids, which are one, two, three, four families in there. And then there's only one family in this section, the hornwort. And then you've got eudicot, eudicot, which covers these families, and plus this clad, clade, which is the um, superosids and superasterids. And you've got the monocots that branches out here. So um, let's see. Go to the next page. The clad, and here are the families. And here are the gymnosperms and the and the clads, clades. All right. So this is what the clades break out to: superosids. These are the, these are the families. If you can read through Peoniaceae, Crassulaceae, and so forth, and you can f um. And actually, I can, this is a live link, so I you can actually click on that. And go, you can go through all these families and see what plants are in there. So um, when I say this and put it in the PDF, all these links will be live and it's um, usable on the PDF. And then here you have to super, let's see, I'm going to click it, yeah. Here's the superosids. 
Here's the family and all the families under the super road seats. They're categorized that way in a story. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go into that because it's just so technical. It's beyond what I understand and beyond the time we have. And the super asteroids are here on this side. Here are the families. So I'm going to highlight later on um, the Lamiaceae fam Lam family later because there's some um, interesting thing I found out myself while I was keying and reading some books. So here we have the Monocots um, a section and we have, let's see, that's, you can go in there and you can click on, I'll show you these links and you can actually go into the families and you can actually see all the families and all the sections that are listed. So you can click through all this and see what's, what's and what's where. It's pretty cool. So here again, the monocots, the families, and the, all the way down there. So what does this all mean? So what is, what, what plant is this? You have this plant and you're wondering what it is. So where, you, where, do, where does it begin? Where do you begin to look for the information? What do you look for? What are the clues? And how do you get to the families and understand what's going on? So are your, are your brains hurting? <laughs> That's a lot of information to digest. And um, yeah, you'll... you'll have fun going through this slide later on and, and click on all the links and see all the information. It's pretty cool. We do have one quick question, uh, maybe not so quick, but um, is a dicot short for you dicot or is dicot mean something else? So the old way used to be dicot. When I learned it was dicot, that's how old I am. <laughs> and then back in the mid, what is it? Uh, early, oh no, wait. 20, after 2010, somewhere around that time frame, um, they put EU back in there as true. I don't know. The, I didn't read the scientific paper. I was. I just kind of got up, updated on that. So um, the 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 old name was di, dicotyledon, and then the current one is eudicotyledon because it's a true true dicot, as they found out. Does that answer the question? Yes, that's oh, great. Yeah. All right. So here, um, this page is um, the table of families, as I showed you before. And you can, let's see, let's go to, um, so here you have the, um, was it the, the phylum uh, divisions of, um, of the plant, and then you have the families for the plants. And here in each family lists the genuses that it belongs to. So if you notice, Asteraceae has a gazillion <laughs> of, of genuses. And like, apparently we have a impatience here. And is that native? And this is what you come out with. Touch me not, maybe not. Does it say? I can't see. Usually it says native or naturalized, but I don't see that here. That's the whole uh, genus, so it, it doesn't show the... Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. That's the family. Excuse me. <laughs> anyway, a lot of information, lots um, of time. So that's one of the uh, pages you can look through for the families. So how do you determine what plant or, uh, or, or organism, we'll just say with plants? So we use the dichotomous key to determine um, what plant it is. And what is the di dich dichotomous key? It's a process of decision making to arrive at an answer. As if you think of software, um, if, you, if this is A, then you would go to B or C to finally get to a decision or function. Uh, for your software, 
Or you can think about your optometrist when you get your eye exam and the, the optometrist usually puts a lens, lens on your eye and say, which one is a better view for you? It's choose one or two. You can't say one and a half, but you got to say one or two. So the dichotomous key is pretty much picking either this, this choice, which then brings you to a different uh, choice or it make it or it goes to the decision or the identification for your plant so that's the process so that brings us to botany in a day which is um this book um it's, it's i haven't bought the book but um they've got stuff online that i had taken off to help us with this lesson today sorry excuse me so back to you, Dicot, <clears throat> just to remember, just, uh, just to uh, refresh your memory again, memory again is two embryonic leaf, the cotyledon, which is these two organs. And you will notice that the word generally is written all over the Jepson manual. Everything is generally because um, nature is dynamic and depending on the author uh, of the plant description there's different terms or different ways of writing or describing something so in the we're going to start off with the mint family and um, the mint family which is the lamiaceae family is a eudicot again Generally, it has square stems, generally opposite leaves, generally aromatic, fragrant, or pungent, irregular flowers, meaning that when you cut it in half in, from top and bottom, the top and bottom do not match. Uh, the seeds are four nutlets. And here's a picture, a diagram of what um, a plant in the mint family would look like. So you've got the opposite leaves as here. You've got the square stem. So what, um, like when you um, harvest mint, if, if you've grown mint in your, in your garden, you've probably um, uh, trimmed some mint or even basil, basil or basil. Those are square stemmed and this is kind of what it looks like. It has four stamens, two short and two long. And these are all generally. And there are exceptions which then take the key takes you to tell you what plant you have. Um, five united petals, meaning they're fused. The petals is tubular because um, all the five petals have fused together to make it um, a tube. And then you've got fused sepals here. Looks like a tube. And then the mature flowers into a seed capsule containing four nutlet, which is kind of um, spare, uh, puts square, squarely on the end of the um, flower. So this is what the Jepson manual describes mint family. So if you know the underlying I started underlining generally, and it seems like it's every other sentence, every sentence has generally in there. So um, that's how botany works. Um, and sometimes when you're out in the field, it's good to have somebody reading the book to you, reading the description while one person looks at the plant. And... Um, when we go botanizing with uh, Joe Cernak and Ken Himes and uh, other people, we have uh, sometimes have three people um, doing this. One person reads the key, two people look at the plant separately to make sure that we're keying it correctly. And um, let's see. So here the habit could be annual to shrub, to tree or vine. So this description, they're looking at worldwide species and genera. So we've been to Asia and there are 
um, mint um, trees in the mint family. I can't remember w which one is it, but the crazy stuff. You know, there's oxalis trees out in Asia. Um, so by understanding your world through some of these descriptions, you kind of, kind of, the world is much, is much bigger than you, <laughs> pretty much. So um, here it describes the leaf, the inflorescence, the flower. Uh, is it generally bisexual, meaning are the flowers complete, incomplete? The calyx, how um, it is hooded, it, how is it paired? Are the um, are some of the stamen exerted, not exerted? So all the descriptions are are laid out so that you can key it properly. Oops. Sorry. And then the fruit, it describes the fruit. And then um, for the family, that describes the generas in the family. It tells you how many generas, how many species, um, some of the common, uh, more common species um, in that family. And these are just some of the credits and the references from the, the manual. All right. The order, so the mint family, the Lamaceae, actually is under the order of Lamiales. I'm just going to use this one sample um, for uh, uh, the Lamaceae because it really helps you understand why things look the way they look. So um, the Lamiale the Lamial order, I've highlighted uh, for the Californian native. Um, in red, that was listed in the Jepson Manual, is the uh, Acanthaceae, the Bignonaceae, Lamiaceae, Lentibulariaceae, I haven't looked that up yet, Mar Martiniaceae, and they list Ole um, Oleaceae, um, and, but in their, yeah, anyway, never mind, and Orobanchiaceae, Frimaceae, that's um, the diplicus, the monkey flowers, the diplicus and the um, uran, uh, uran um, I'll just say the monkey flowers. Um, and the Plantage uh, Plantagenaceae, Scrufulariaceae, and, and Verbenaceae. So keep, so there are, I'm gonna pull out, I think f three or four samples out of this to show you the similarities in it. So here, here's a question, why do some families look similar? So as I mentioned, the Lamio family order, and here is how it's listed in Jepson, and I've bracketed those families. And we can look at Lamiaceae, Scrofulariaceae, and Verbenaceae. And here it is. This is Lamiaceae, this is the hummingbird sage. Um, salvia spathacea and if you notice here's the square stem the opposite leaves and then you've got the fused uh, sepals and then you've got the fused flowers I'm not going to list all the other features but this is some of the features of similarities with the other families here on this side is the Stachys bellata, which is the uh, California hedge nettle um, in the Lamaceae family. If you notice here, the square stem, the opposite leaf, but then you have the um, bee plant. The bee plant is Scrofularia californica. It's in the Scrofulariaceae family, but look at it's so similar. When I was first botanizing, I got really confused with this because I was looking at the bee plant. I said, how can this be? Um, it, and, and, but the bee plant doesn't have any fragrance or strongly scented at all, not that I didn't notice. But if you look at the flower, you've got that tubular flower with the three, um, the lower three petals fuse and the top two petals are also fused. You look at the fl flower on the um, bee plant. They're different. They're fused somewhat, but not totally fused. They're different. They're stacked differently. So here are the keys that tells you um, when you go through the key. It 
it leads you to a different plant. Then you have the Verbena ACA. Now, I thought this was definitely in the mint family, but no, it's not. It's the Verbena, what is it? The Western Vervain, Verbena Lasiostachys. So you have the square stem and you have the opposite leaves, but if you look at the flowers, they're somewhat different. It's still tubular, but you'll have to look at the key and how they split off. So that's, and I didn't notice it until I went, went to England and bought the Q, the uh, newest book that Q produces, The Tree of Life. And I was reading um, the La Lamiaceae family and then I flipped through um, and looked at the Lamio family and then that just what, totally opened up my eyes that now I truly understand why some plant of different families have similar characteristics because of the order they're in the same order and it splits off so the second plant we have is the mustard family the brassicaceae family it's a eudicot four petals four sepals six stamens four tall and two short, pistil in the middle, superior ovary, seed pods and sil are siliques or silicles. So these are the main character, general characteristics of, um, of a mustard or brassicaceae family. So here's the diagram. You have the four sepals and the four petals, one, two, three, four, and the sepals are around it. And then you've got the stamens, four tall and two short. And the pistil, which is in the middle. And the seed come in two different types, a silique type and a silical type. So how do I remember which is what, what name um, when you read the, um, the, uh, read the, um, uh, the flora? So when I look at the silique, the Q, it's got a long straight tail, and I just associate that with the long, slender seed pods, the silics. And then the silicles, which are rounded, and if I see the C for silicle, that would, I would associate with the rounded seed pods, the silicles. So that's my mnemonics to how to remember things for this type of uh, structure and some and then some of the seed pods would split both ways or not have or do the different ways to key different mustards depending on how they're, they're grown such how they're structured so here is um Jepson manual describing what a must what mustard family is um the habit leaf structures generally simple and you've got inflorescence generally racing generally not bright <laughs> so um and then you've got the flower that describes the flower S stamens are generally six to f you know six but two or four there are exceptions depending on what um uh, genus it's in fruit again silique and silical it tells you whether it dehisses by two valves or indehiscent. It doesn't dehiss, it doesn't split, um, etc. And seeds, there could be one or two seed or a whole um, chamber full, you know, running from six to eight, depending on what it is. And that continues on to the genera in the family. There are 330 genera to 3,000 plus species worldwide. And it goes on about telling different um, types of um, brassic, bra uh, brassica and what their uses are for. So we have a picture here. This is the, um, let's see, let me put this down here. This is the Western wallflower, the Ericium uh, capitatum, var capitatum. And here is the four petals. And how the old name for brassicaceae was crucif. It means crucifix. I can't pronounce that word. Cruciferate. Cross. 
I'm sorry? Crucifere? Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> it means the cross because um, back in the old days, you know, uh, the, Roman, the, the Roman Catholic and uh, the church religion was a big part of society and they use a lot of religion for associating things. Was it mnemonics? Something like that. So here we have four petals, two, three, and four, and it has um, six, six stamens somewhere here. It's really bunched up, so I wasn't able to dissect it and look at it, but here's the basic. First, you look at the petals and the way it crosses like that, and then you look into the petal and uh, look into the inside to look at look for the stamen. And here is the Mount Diablo jewel flower, Streptanthus his hispidus. It's hairy all over. It again, you still have the four petals here. So that's uh, your main key is when you look at the flower of a mustard, it's four petals. In 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 this type of um, structure. Um, formation. So this is uh, the jewel flower at Style Ranch, and I I need to go back and key this one because I suspect this one is Streptanthus glandulosa sus, subspecies albidus. For those who um, know this plant, it's the supposedly the Metcalf Canyon jewel flower, but this is out in Style Ranch, with, which they said is something different. Um, but um, I've been looking at my old photos and I'm looking at the colline leaves, how the leaves stack up. Uh, they, you know, they're not glaber, they're glaberous and they look different from what um, the key for what it's originally said um, the Streptanthus was. Judy, do you know the, uh, the Streptanthus at Style Ranch? Is it glandulosa? Glen well, that's kind of a confusing genus, but the yeah. older name was was most beautiful jewel flower. Yeah, right. Albinus paraminus, right. but um, Param right. Yeah. Now but they're all not... yeah. So it's kind of a mix up. Yeah, they've dumped it as something else. <laughs> anyway, it's all very. Confusing. I think I think we can say it's most beautiful and leave it at that. Right. And and this flower actually what made me fall in love with California native plants. I, I when I saw this out in Style Ranch on by, by myself. I, I, I fell to my knees and I was almost in tears. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> that this is the plant that got me into where I am today. And you wouldn't think it's a mustard. <laughs> no, exactly. All right, here are the seed pods, uh, the Salikes of the Bucheria Brewerii, uh, Brewer's Rock Crest. So this crazy looking plant with the crazy seed pods and they look like little daggers and they look like swords. So, um, Salik is with a Q and that the Q has that tail, long straight tail that reminds me of, oops, sorry, the, the long, um, seed pods. And then you have silical. This is fringe pod. Cyanocarpus curvipes. Is that right? So species curvipes or vipes. Um, so um, here's the seed, uh, the seed pod or the silicone. It's round like the sea. So that helps me with some of the vocabularies. Quite pretty. Now we have the parsley or the carrot family, uh, officially known as the Apiaceae family. Eudicot, uh, compound umbels, small flower, petals and five, five stamens, Ov uh, inferior ovaries, which is two cell, and the fruit is called a schizocarp. carp. Like, yeah. And here is the diagram for the APAC family is two cell ovary. I have a picture of it splitting so you can see much better. And here's the five petals. Compound umbel. Remember uh, if 
um, any of you t taken the last class I taught uh, last uh, in January? Um, talks about um, morphology. Compound is multiple umbels. So this is one umbel. And when it stacks up to having this many umbels, it's a compound umbel. Then you have inv involucra of bracts, which is these little things underneath um, the compound umbels. Right, and this is what Jeps Manual describes the APAC family. Um, it tells you the habit, some of the, um, it could be annual, perennial herbs, it could be tree or shrub because they're talking about worldwide um, species. Stems are generally plus minus scapos, plus or minus. It can have or it may not, not have uh, scapos. Scapos is the part where the flower, the head of the flower sits on top of that stem. Um, is it generally ribbed and hollow? So it tells you what, what it's like um, celery. You know, it's ribbed. That's, that's in the APAC family. Or the parsley, yeah. It tells you the description of the leaf. Inflorescence, umbel or head, simple or compound, um, any peduncles, bracts, etc. And then flowers, it describes different kinds of flowers. It's mainly um, compound, um, very small flowers. Oops, sorry. Um, fruit, two dry fruit, um, they're seeded in half equals mericarp and then uh, separating from each other but generally it, it, that's all the description of of the seed and then the 300 genera and 3,000 species well, plus or minus worldwide um, we have uh, things like caraway uh, darkest which is carrot that's in the family you've got poison hemlock in the family which is highly toxic and there's other notes here. So here is the cow parsnip Heraclium maximum. So you can see one of this flower. And we notice this ovary here. It, it splits right in the middle. It's halved. That's your basic characteristic of the APAC family, the carrot family. That is your key to hone in when you look at the seed, when you look at the ovary. And there's your petal, it's a bit eaten up. Two, three, four, five petals. And we're gonna look at this little flower here. And these are the stamens. One, two, three, four, five. Five stamens. And there's a crab uh, spider there. I was actually taking the picture of the spider. <laughs> All right, and here's the and the flower of the cow parson, the, the inflorescence of the, of the cow parson is big as my face. They're huge. And some have gone to seed already. And they're still in flower. And here's the dried up um, fruit. This is of Lomatium macrocarpum, big seeded biscuit root. And here where it's dried, I took this picture in October. Out in Style Ranch a long time ago. And here's the seed that splits into two. That's the schizzle carp. And those are one of the keys of looking at seeds to see if they split. Um, to tell you it's, it's in the APAC family. All right. P family. The Fabaceae family. Don't mix that with Fagaceae family, which is the, the, the beach where the oak oak tree um, family is. Fabaceae with a B. Eudicot. Irregular flowers. Have banner petal. Two wing petals. One keel consists of two petals fused together. Sepals fused. Superior ovary. Fruit, which are legumes, elongated seed pods. We all know what peas are. We love, you know, it's um, beans, 
and um, fava beans is not sugar snap, snap sugar snaps they're all in the pea family um, red bud is in the pea family and so we have irregular flower because when you cut that in half the top and bottom are different looking you have the banners which are this thing that looks like a banner and waving at you and then you've got the wing on both sides of the keel it protects the keel so how do you remember the word keel is to me it looks like a foot is about to kick somebody with a k <laughs> it's hidden between two wings they kind of look like wings um all right here's a pea light pods p pea, two peas in the pod the saying goes and you have pinnately compound leaves. That's one of the characteristics of the Fabaceae family. And pinnate is where the, the two leaves are actually opposite of each other. And it's an oddly pinnate compound leaf because the last leaf is a single leaf. It's an odd number. This is one of the keys. Um, in Keynes, uh, particular trees or um, uh, particular types of um, pea family uh, plants. All right, Fabaceae family. Um, so they're annuals to trees, as in from the sugar snaps to, um, or even the um, trifolium, um, the acme spawn to tree, which is um, the red bud. Uh, the leaf are generally alternate, generally compound, generally stipule. So generally, because it all branches to different types of uh, genuses. And that's how, um, when you go to the key, it's, you can then get to the right plant. It's very, keying is very difficult because if you're very challenging reading it's it's very difficult um and then you've got the flower the fruit the seed etc and then the genera there are that many species around the world and then this is a picture of i forgot to put the name it's um ooh. um something stipularis uh, Judy, um, it's out at um, Polgus Ridge. Is it? Ho oh, Hosakia? Yeah, Hosakia. I always, I always get Hosakia Horkelia all mixed up. So, because they're both H. <laughs> I'm not sure. But I just wanted to mention that keel refers to like the bottom of a boat is a keel. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Very yeah, so good. So good. Keeling good. over and keel hauling. There's your the keel. Right. Yeah, because it looks like the bottom of a. Of, I don't boat. I don't go boating or anything so um but anyway good point there the keel is right here and the two wings so here's the banner here are the wings and the keel is right there and then the compound leaf and the stipu hence the stipularis the uh, the uh, specific epithet is called here's the stipules these are one of the key features for keying this plant out. And here are the seed pods. And they all hang like this. It's pretty cool. And then for keying different species of Fabaceae, the seed pods could... So if you look at the seed pod here, the bumpy, and they have maybe glands or little bits of hair. So all these little features need to be looked at, whether it's hairy or not, whether it have little bumps or not. Those are very important to look at when you're keying a plant. If you look close up here also, are the, are the stems hairy? Are the, the leaves hairy tomatoes? Are they matted down? Are they sticking up? There's multiple ways of describing the plant and to find the right name for the plant. All right, rose family, rosaceae. That's um, uh, eudicot, numerous stamens, usually five petals, 
because if you look at the roses that you buy at the store, you have more than five petals because they've been hybridized so much, they're designer roses. So, but we're talking about the basic general um, um, rose family plant that have not been hybridized to the point where they've actually bred for more petals. Five sepals, inferior ovary, fruit, which is a palm, but it could be something else. I have an asterisk here. Jetson Man just has additional um, uh, fruit description that are not palm. So here we have um, this five separate sepals, which is actually the back of the, um, the flower, which actually covers the bud the the petals um, when it's a flower bud so that's just a cross section of the rosebud you've got five separate petals you got numerous stamens I mean countless I wouldn't even count it it's just ridiculously a lot and then you've got numerous styles which is um, the um, Female, um, female reproductive part, and then you've got the serrated. So serrated leaves, the the edge of the leaves are serrated usually, and then you have also compound leaves. But you also have these that are palmated leaves. So different plants, different genuses do different things. All right. Rose family is described in the Eve, um, Jeps manual. So annual to tree, glandular or not. Uh, the leaves can be simple to palmate, to pinnately compound multiple different ways uh, to um, for um, a um, rose family type plant um, inflorescence as you know the rose has all kinds multiple um, uh, clusters racing signs etc oops sorry um, flowers describes the flower the shape you know how many sepals etc the fruit I have an asterisk here. One many per flower it can be a keen, it could be a follicle, a droop, or a poem. But generally, it could be papery core, occasionally droop light, or with one or five stones. So you have different kinds of fruit uh, for the rose family. Oh, sorry. Uh, seed, telling you um, how many seed per fruit it can have. Genera, there are like 110 to 3,000 species worldwide. Most famously, the rose family is the roses, of course, Rosa. You've got the malice, the apple, the prune, the prunus, the pyracantha, the rubus, which is our raspberries. Um, and here we have a rose species. And here's the petal. Five petal, one, two, three, four, five, and you got the stigma, which is the female reproductive part, and then you have the stamens, which are the male parts, the anther and the filament, right there. All right, this is Rosa spith, spithame, uh, sorry, spith, spathamia, spathamia is the word, <laughs> and um, if you look at the um, Note the compound leaves. There's two types of compound leaves in the typical rose. Rosa is you've got five leaf compound and you've got the three leaf compound. I don't know the reason, but I know when you do rose pruning in a garden, when you want to uh, prune the rose to, to promote more flowers, you cut it at the five leaf compound leaf. If you cut it up, if you prune it at the three leaf you don't get flowers um, or you don't get as much but when you prune it down here you promote more flowers in your roses then you've got the inferior ovary and you've got the sepal 
on top of the ovary, exposing the ovary. And if you note, there are glands on the sepal and the ovaries. That's one of the keys on spithamia uh, um, versus other roses that don't have these glands. And here's a comparison on uh, Rosa spithamia here in fruit. If you notice, these are all the glands that kind of dried up and hardened and they're like little um, bristles or prickly stuff. Um, and then this is Rosa californica. If you look at the stem on that, it's full of thorns full of thorns and the hip for the californica is glabrous it's totally hairless there's nothing it's glossy clean so that these are the differences in the the, the two species of roses and also if you notice the californica has a neck here where the uh, sepal um, has attached itself there's no neck here and then we look at the sepals, you know, you've got the gland, the dried up glands, and there's no glands. I think those may could be hairs. I'm not too sure. The photo's not too good. I've kind of blown it up, and things are kind of pixelated. But that's some of the um, <clears throat> things you look for when you key is the differences, the the look, are there hairs, are the um prickles are there uh, what characteristic are you looking at so you have the aster family now which is the asteraceae it's also a eudicot consists of many small flowers it's attached to a pitted disc there's ray flowers and there's also disc flowers um, the disc flowers are fused five fused petals I have asterisk, there's a sample, and the seeds are keen. And here's a diagram, and here is the five fused uh, petals that makes it look like a tube. I'm going to show a different diagram. This, the other diagram, I've shown it in the, uh, the first class, so I'm going to go to that one, which has more detail in it. So here's the head. The, the inflorescent of the, um, as, um, could say, quote-unquote, sunflower-type flower. So you have the pedicel, which the flower is attached to. Reciprocal is the fleshy part where the dis, um, uh, the flower attaches to. You have the fillery, which is these so-called bracts, quote-unquote. But sunflowers, for the Asteraceae fan, they use fillories rather than bracts. And the bracts can be imbricate, stacking, or biseriate, meaning um, two. There's two stacks of them, two layers. And then uniseriate, which is probably a single layer or, f or kind of a flat. They s kind of lie flat. And then you've got the ray, which is the ligo, they call it. And here they call it the limb. The claw, which is this section, which kind of wraps the uh, stigma. You've got the pappus here. Some pappus have these kind of hairs. Some are more fleshy than others. This is the akin, which is the actual seed where um, the seed germinates from. This is the actual embryo ovary and then the disc flower is this whole section which is part um this whole flower is the disc flower you got the stigma the staminal tube um and then you've got the lobe they call this the lobe is like the petal but it's very tiny and then you've got the corolla tube which is fused it's five petals fused fused together to make the tube and here is an example of um, I, by suriate fillories. This is the leaf stem tick seed, the Coreopsis calliopsidiae. 
Um, so there's a, two layers. If you notice here, there's one layer of fillerees, like it's almost like a cup. Then it's got the saucer, like the plate to hold the flowers, the saucer, cup and saucer. <laughs> So that's um, the, that's how you distinct, distinguish a Coreopsis from other sunflowering, uh, so, so other Asteraceae's. So you have that two layer. Here is Wyithia, the narrow leaf mule's ear, the Angustifolia. So you have fillories, many fillories, but they but it's not separated. They kind of stack together. Um, nicely and that's the the feature for the wyithia some would maybe have hairs no hairs this is quite hairy um, some are glabrous meaning no hair so these are some of the features you need to look at when you key to find out to see wh what kind of wyithia it is or which kind of wyithia which species And here's Asteraceae um, description from the Jepson Manual. There are 15 groups. It's a very large, large family. It's very, it's mind-boggling to, to key some of these uh, plants out. So um, there, here are all the descriptions of them. And here's another page that tells you how many genera and how many species worldwide. And... Um, there, they also describe some of the changes in the in in the Asteraceae and on what's been moved where or um, some of the information on different um, um, species. So here, I think um, for those who saw my class, la my last class, this is a the same slide on the disc and ray. What are disc and rays? Here's a narrow leaf. Um, mule's ear here and uh, you look at it this is what the close-up of the disc flower looks like this is the mount hamilton thistle which is only um disc flowers same with the rayless arnica they I either call it um disc flower or rayless and then we have um the holy dandelion Gyptopleura setulosa. These are all ray flowers. If you look at the center here, there are no discs, all ray flowers. This is in the chicory tribe, like the lettuce, which is the chicory tribe. It's in that, um, that class, so to speak. Quite beautiful. And then you've got the seed, they're keen of the, of, um, the mountain dandelion, Agrocerus grandiflora. These are the akeen. The keens are these little brown seeds with a parachute. And if you look closely, they are ribbed. They're so cute. I stuck my, my camera lens inside it and I said, oh, wow. It's very cool. And that's the akeen. That's the head. And I took another close up another one and, and if you look at the ribs, they haven't dried it dried out yet, so it looks still pretty fresh and fleshy here. It's pretty amazing when you peer through these little plants or plants. That's the Akeen. And then here's another Agrocerus. And it seems like a little more fresher or it could be a different species, I'm not sure. It's not as ribbed as the earlier one. And then this is silver puff, uh, Europapis lindleyi. These are the Akeens. These are the, the what is it? Uh, um, so if you look at it, they're the Akeens, the little parachute. And then to identify them, um, one of the key um, identifying key is whether the the on here or this point here splits in two or not. If it's split, it's something else. So you have to, these are the little features in, in looking at finding out what plant you have. All right, monocots. So monocots are basically um, 
plants that have one embryonic leaf that comes up, mainly your grasses, your um, lilies, alliums, and many, many other type of families, um, juncus, etc. So here you have the cotton lead in right here. That's the part is a food storage system for the plant to help it germinate. So we have the lily family, lily ACA family. It's a monocot. Three sepals, three petals that are similar in size and color are called tepals. You have six stamens, three parted pistil or carpal. So everything's like in a set of threes. Fruit or capsules or berries. And here's a diagram of a lily. You've got parallel veins. That is your key to a monocot. Pistils with three parted stigma. It looks like a Y. And the six stamens, which are these two, three, four, five, six. And then the sepals, three sepals and three petals. So one, so the one, two, three sepals and the T, the, oh, sorry, three petals, which actually are the inner part. And then the sepals are the ones that wrap the bud up, but they actually look the same as the petals, which again are called tepals. All right. So here's Liliaceae family described by in the Jepsen manual, um, mainly herb, herb and perennial herb. Um, it could be have bulbs or scaly rhizomes. Uh, stems could be underground, erect branched or not. Leaf could be basal or coralline, alter alternate world, subopposite. Inflorescence could be racemes or panicles, umbel or not. Flowers, it describes all different kinds of uh, flowers. It could be worlds or not showy, could be very small. Oops. Capsules are, the fruits are capsules or berries. Seeds are in three, flat, angle, black or brown. And here are the different genera's, not m many, 16 genera's only. 635 species in the North, Northern Hemisphere and you, you can read on about all the other stuff. So they've actually, s s they used to lump most of these in the lily family, they've now split them up back into what uh, most of them used to be. You've got Ag Agaviaceae, you've got Aliaceae, you've got Amaryllidaceae, you've got Melanthiaceae and all kinds of, uh, all kinds of Smilocinaceae. <laughs> so the, they've been split up. So you can read up on this to see um, what family, what genus is in what family. Here um, I have the Humboldt lily. This was taken out on Santa Cruz Island, the Lilium Humboldtia subspecies os oscillatum, or oscillatum. If you notice here, here's the, the one, two, three, four, five, six stamens. And then you've got the three split on the stigma, see that Y. That's the three, three uh, pistol. All right, here is the um, Fritillaria pleuroflora, which is the adobe lily. It's a rare lily. Um, you've got three petals, two, three, and then three sepals again, two, three. And that, and that's on the outer layer, which equals the sepals. I think by now you, you guys, probably have it drilled into your head. <laughs> Petals, sepals equals tepals. <laughs> and this is the cutest fritillaria fruit capsule I've ever seen in my life. 
it looks like a marshmallow on a stick. It's the yellow fritillary, and I've not seen the flower yet. I have to go out um, soon, one of these days, to go go look for it. It's out in lava beds. It's out in that area in Modoc County. And this is the fruit capsule. If you can see, there's a, the, the three split here, the three chamber for the capsule. And then... I think we're on our last family. This is the grass family, Poaceae family. Um, so the grass is also splits into uh, the Juncus, the Cypress, but I'm not going to go into that family. It's just the Poaceae, um, just so you know. So it's a monocot again. It's wind pollinated. The, those bracts, uh, the bracts from modified leaves. There's three stamens, one pistil with two plus stigmas, and the seed are grains. And here's the diagram. So you have the sheath that is part of the blade that wraps the calm. Then you have the spikelet on the inflorescent, which is all of the spikelets. Spikes, ooh, the spikelets breaks up into this one spikelet. You have the gloom, which wraps the florets. And the lima is what wraps the grain. So that's the lima. You have a keel right here, kind of curved with a nerve here at the end, at the center. That wraps the reproductive parts, the anther, filament, the stigma. It could be feathery or plumose. So that depends on, again, the species you're looking at or even the genera, mainly. One-sided, one-seeded ovary, that's the grain. And you've got luticle. It's probably how the florets attaches to the lima. These are the scars. For, uh, of the lima when it detaches. It's a bisexual flower. And then this, all this is wrapped into here. When this gets fertilized, the grain, the pelia, the grain is develops. There you have the floret. All right, here's the grass family. Um, the habit, describe the habit, the stem, there's many, many, many types of grasses or Poaceae. Um, and I'm not going to read. So there's like 650, 900 genera to 10,550 species or more, you could say. Um, there are many, many types of grasses, um, invasive, or, you know, um, bamboo is one of them. Um, there. This is uh, one of the lovely of grasses I, I know for our native grasses, the Melica species. This could be Toriana. I'm not too sure. I haven't keyed that out. I took this picture many years ago out in Style Ranch. And for grasses, is you have little notches, or I call them knees. The knees bend are grasses. Grasses have knees. And that's how you tell it, uh, a grass from a juncus. Then um, this is a breakdown of a Melica species. So you have the glooms here. The gloom wraps the, le the floret, which is this. And there could be many florets in, within a gloom. So you have the gloom. The lima is the outer cover. And then the pelia, pelia is the other the smaller sided covering. You have the anther. You can't quite see the uh, filament there. And then you've got the stigma on the ovary. This is the feathery looking thing. And then you've got the ovary here. So here we have and the, uh, probably the same Melica. It's a uh, Toriana probably. So you have the stigma, the feathery attachment to the ovary. You have the filament, 
attaching the anthers and those a tiny some pollen covered specks of white stuff all the pollen so that's how it's wind pollen it drops down and it waves in the wind and this was, this picture was very hard to take and it was like blowing all over the place so I got lucky and got some kind of image that you could see even the filaments and, and the anthers dangling down it's pretty it's pretty awesome when you see it it's like waving tassel that is a beautiful photo thank you and the glooms are up here Melica is just beautiful the, my favorite native grass and they come in multiple species from Californica Toriana in what, what was the other one um there's many <laughs> I'm still learning <laughs> Here's um, Ons, gloom. this is the gloom, these are the glooms, all the, the seed had all dropped off, the grains have dropped, the lemons dropped. So this is waving the wind with just the gloom hanging on. Um, uh, this is the Melica, and this, and this one is also, this is Stiper. I'm not sure which one, um, but the stipe has one on at the end of the seed. It attaches, it comes out of here, I think. Well, it's part of the lima. I'm not sure. I can't quite tell. And then you have this. This is the non-native um, uh, oat. The non-native oat. Um, and it has two ons here. So I'm, this is very good. All right, cool. So what's in the name? So we're going to go into the part where why or how things are named or per, just kind of explaining the name, naming of plants, really. So a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet as uh, William Shakespeare has uh, written out for Romeo and Juliet. So here we am get rid of this. So who invented the system? It's Carl Linnaeus. He's a Swedish botanist, and he invented the binomial two naming non uh, the nomenclature taxonomy systematics. That's what they call it. It's a uniform way of naming organisms. And he died at around the age of seventy ish. That's just a little snippet of information there for, of, of him of who invented it. So why naming is important? Like I said, humans like to classify everything. Common names versus scientific names. A lot of the, I hate to say the common folks, so the everyday layman would use common names for plants because that's how their world is, where the scientists would use scientific names to make sure that have, they have named that, they, they know they're talking about the same plant and not some other plant that has uh, multiple common names or um, three plants that have the same common name. So just make sure they don't make any mistakes in what they're doing. It tells where it comes from, tells you where, what the family is, tell you what the genus is, and tells you about the individual, which kind of is the spe uh, specific epithet. Genus and species name can be named after a place or person. It doesn't have to be a specific um, way uh, of naming. Um, you know, if it's honoring somebody, it can be named after, um, like, with uh, Miss, this uh, botanist named Dedecara. There's a, one plant in that genus is named Dedecara. And also Linnea has a flower named after him. All right, binomial late nomenclature. What does that mean? So it's a two-word naming system for organism. It's written, it's Latin or Greek. Um, genus is um, pretty much the last name of the plant. And the specific epitaph, which is the species name, is like the first name. 
then you have the subspecies, the variety ranking, additional names to separate the differences within the genus. So you have the genus, the species, the subspecies with the subspecies name. And subspecies is a higher ranking than your variety of var as it's written here. So you have genus, species, and var XYZ, which is a lower rank than subspecies. Then you've got hybrids, which has the genus name, and um, usually, sometimes the hy mostly, the hy some hybrids that were discovered accidentally um, in a garden or out in the wild, they put um, an X there with a sp known species um, or uh, one of the parent. So this is how a hybrid is written. And then you have the cultivar. A cultivar uh, name would be written with a, a single quotation. It's usually named after a person or some place. So we have a, um, it's a holodiscus, which is called Tilden, because the plant that they found at Tilden and cultivated, it's very flat and low-lying. It's decumbent. It doesn't get more than 12 inches tall. Where um, uh, where your normal holodiscus is, um, you know, could be, we've seen it more than 5, 10 feet up in the, um, up in, up in Washington because it's so um, moist up there. It gets really huge. But here, probably like an Edgewood, it's about five feet maybe maximum or less, depending. And then here it's written uh, genus with the cultivar, or it could be written with the species and cultivar. And hold on, this is missing. And then you, the writing convention when publishing uh, the names is written with italicized, or it could be uh, unitalicized with an underline. And the genus needs to start with the capital, and the species is just lowercase. Um, here are some basic naming rules for the plants. Um, they uh, use neutral, feminine, and masculine uh, na uh, naming rules. I'm not going to go into how they're named, but these are some of the names that you can recognize that you can tell whether it's feminine, masculine, or neutral. For us, it doesn't really matter. It's more for the taxonomist that wants to argue about all this stuff. <laughs> so we have genus species ending should be the same. So your name for the genus and the name for the species should say, should uh, end in the same syllable or same uh, ending. Um, so the genus ending with um is neutral, like Lilium humboldtii, so species oscillatum. That's a neutral gender. Then you have a genus ending with a, ago, a, is, is feminine. And um, here's some of the names. Uh, Cephalothera, Austinae, and Fritillaria eastwoodiae. So you've noticed the a, a, e, a, e ending. It's named after um, uh, uh, women botanists. Here you have a genus ending with us is masculine, quercus. There are exceptions. I've looked at several genus that ends with us and they don't really follow any. It, some of them are is, some are a, I don't know. <laughs> so it's, you know, there's always exceptions. Um, and then yes, there's always exceptions with the author that so what is in a name? So uh, this is a courtesy of the CMPS Santa Monica Mountain Mountain Chapter. They have this Latin 101 uh, website web page, and here it is. It's pretty. Not, it's a pretty uh, good, easy to to read. You know, it's an alpha alphabetized, and if you click Alba means white, Alpine is Alpine, and et cetera. You run through it. It explains 
you the name of the plant like uh, why is it angustifolia why is it angustifolia because the leaves are narrow leaved uh, mules ear there's wyethia glabra glabra means hairless and the plant is hairless where angus gustifolia is much more hairier and it's narrow leaf where glabra has very wide um, glabra sleeves so that's how you can tell with the name and uh, if you looked at it and just oh the leaves are wide and glabrous oh it could be glabra and if you know it's wyethia you could say oh it's wyethia glabra without having to look in the book and look at the flora so you can narrow things down pretty pretty uh, pretty nicely i would say all right so you can go through this way go to this way and just look at glaze or learn some of these um when when you use it often enough and hear it often enough it comes in it comes in through it's like an earworm as they say it come you look at the plant and it, like the word just comes out of your head <laughs> so that's um that page and and then there's some examples of the nomenclature suffixes and prefaces so here similar or like is oides lada or latum like stachys jugoides, it's this is not native. This is from Europe or Asia. It's bugle hedge nettle, because um, the stachys. Wait a minute. This is a. Is this native, Judy? I forget. Stachys. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, because I know there's a, a there's a juga. I'm mixing it with that because it does look like the non-native ajuga. <laughs> That's what they called it, Stachys ajugoides. Yeah, well, there's those names again. Yeah, so it looks like a juga. So there you go. It works. Um, and then Iriogonum fasciculatum. Uh, latum looks like fascic uh fascicle, meaning um, bunched. The leaves come out at a single point. It bunches up. And Eric America fasciculata, same thing. The leaves are probably linear, and they come out like, uh, like a bunch, like needles. So a name tells a lot of the characteristic of the plant. And by looking at that plant, and if you know how to describe it, pretty much you can come to, to the name of the plant. Uh, leaf is phyla, phylum. That's in Greek. Folia, folium in Latin. You've got California macrophylla, which is the large leaf. Wait a minute. That doesn't make sense. Pardon me. <laughs> There's a typo there. Large, I think I was meant to write Acer macrophylum, large leaf maple. Anyway, scratch that out. <laughs> You've got Calamagrostis foliosa, leafy reed grass. And you've got the genus Trifolium. Tri is three, folium is leaf. So it's three leaf, like the three leaf clover. Then you flower, uh, you use flore, flory or floro or flora, like Hachelia floribunda. You've got Rosa floribunda, many flower. That's the stick stick seed and Cryptantha clevelandia var flora florosa. So coastal cryptantha. Probably means it's got more flowers than the other ones. I'm not sure. We have a question. Um, yes. Why are the genera named according to sexes? And what would determine what determine which genus would be named a particular sex? That I don't know. It's a very long paper, and I I can't read it. It's very technical. That's that's what taxonomists do. That's their forte is to name it the way they want to name it. I haven't a clue, um, so um, I can't really tell. Does anybody in the audience know why? Someone did mention that we also need a Greek one hundred and one pages. So. Yeah. <laughs> science, science 101 science, science one, yeah what a nomenclature one one but there is so the book that i had recommended 
you know, the plant identification terminology book. I think uh, has the gl glossary has all that. So fruit and carpal, which is basically um, use carpa, carpus, carpum, carpa. Oh, that's sorry, typo again. Uh, Lomation dazzy carpum. Dazzy means hairy or woolly. Carpum fruit is the woolly fruited parsley or lomation. Calicordus macrocarpus, the sagebrush mariposa lily has very large fruits. And you got Emsinchia spectabulus var microcarpa, which is the small fruited seaside fiddle net. So it all, they all kind of describe, usually most of them describe the plant. Unless it's named after somebody, then it's you totally, you have to memorize, kind of recognize it by sight or by, you know, you're looking for that plant. Um, you know, anyways, yeah, when it's named after a person, it's pretty difficult. Like, Sinoglossum changed its genus to be named after some botanist's daughter's name. Annalina? Is that what? Alinia? Adelinia? Yeah. So it's named after one of the botanist's daughter. I think the botanist that, yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so go figure. <laughs> it's all up to the author, I believe. And here is um last time somebody asked what kind of lens I have I have I have two more here. I have some other ones which I can find. It's somewhere in my pocket in my car or somewhere. Um this one has um it's it has a light. My battery died. So I have these two lights that you can light up because when you hold the lens up close to the plant, it's dark because you're, you've you shaded out the sunlight um, out of your, your plant you're looking at. So by having that light clo um, with the hand lens, it, it's very handy. It's one of my, it's my favorite um, hand lens. I have to go buy batteries. It's died, so I haven't find, found the batteries yet. And this one is very, the one on the right here is a very cheap one. Um, it's like a buck or two. Somebody had bought a whole box of these and were handing it out um, at one of the field trips. Um, but anyway, and I was, I looked this one up. Oh, look at that. Here's the light. <laughs> um, so I looked this up. It says on Amazon, it was under $10 at Walmart. I can't believe it. So Google uh, illuminated hand lens, and then you can see, you could get online. Um, I got this at a trade fair down in LA for free. I was so thrilled. It was, um, there's some advertising here. I blocked that out. But anyway, that this is one of the coolest uh, hand lens. That it, that's neat. You know, uh, the Bryophy chapter, our Moss chapter, they also recommend some tools, and I put that link in the chat to their webpage. Oh, so okay. they recommend certain yeah. hand lenses and tweezers right. and microscopes for Great. those who want to get into those. And this is a 30, I think a 30X or 40X, so it's really good. Because uh, this one on the right is only 10X. If it's a 30 or 40X, I mean, you can split hairs with this one. <laughs> Uh, we had a question about the book you recommended, Plant Identification Terminology. That yes. one is out of print now, or do you know? I don't know. Um, I got this a long time ago when I was in school. <laughs> um, does the state carry this, or if you Google no. it, you have no, to get the, it the, online? Somewhere. The state doesn't count, uh, carry it, but there's a lot of used copies online um, through yeah. Ian and Powell. Yeah. yeah. I we think I would just go copies. for a used copy. Yeah, Ken and I each have our own copy because I had this before I met him. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can look for the books that the CMPS State um, carries on. If you just Google them, I'll put it in the chat. But um, our chapter has limited. We're not going to be probably buying more new new books, but we do have always have used books circling through that. We'll have quite a few right now. We'll have at our um, wildflower show and so forth. So stay tuned for those. Right, and the wild and a wildflower by well, wildflower by any name. That's a book about 
um botanist it tells them about their story and um and it's pretty interesting because by understanding some of these people you kind of because their name are probably littered within all the bot the the uh, the plant names so then it becomes a little then you have the story behind the name it's pretty pretty cool pretty interesting uh, so i'm reading um you know eat um re reading through each of the botanists in the book and it's pretty cool to understand if you really want to dig into the history there's also a great book called herbarium which goes into all the different all goes into a lot of this so um i did have another question if you don't mind me pulling it up before the end yeah sure. are uh Kalagii, douglasiana and menziesii all cases of botanists naming species after themselves as well so um now a collector usually cannot name a plant um what how do you say that you can name you cannot name a plant after yourself if you collected it you have to send it in for the person for the person who needs to identify it. the person who ident who keys it out gets to name it i believe and if they like you they'll name it after the collector or they'll name it after the friend or there's no rhyme or reason it's whatever the author wants to name it after so um that's, yeah, that's what that's pretty much the right the story behind taxonomy <laughs> yeah, that's what the, everybody a palsy wowsy with well, <laughs> Or, you know, like I was reading about Green, what's the name? Greeny Eye, Green, um, he's an enemy of Azza Gray. Mm. <laughs> There's a lot of politics back in the day. Oh my God, it's insane. Wishing people dead and. <laughs> <laughs> and but things change, things keep getting renamed. So, uh, another question about naming is that um, why do you use the same name twice in a two times in a row, like Arisimum Capitatum, Var Capitatum? Uh, I think that's to uh, indicate the, is it the type? What do you call the, the species? Wait, what's the, what's it the mean varieties or subspecies, varieties or subspecies. So you have the name twice. So there's Arisimum capitatum, yeah. bar capitatum, yeah. and then there are other Arisimum capitatum. Yeah. So, so what it starts out with, um, like capitatum, capitatum, uh, var species i think that's the type species is that what they call it is what what sure and I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> i think that it's it's a whole different i don't go much into i haven't gotten to that part but i may go look at it after this but i think like certain plants that have like a capitatum var subspecies let's just stay oh Opisboensis, because they'll name the after a place because it's only found in that place, but it wouldn't carry uh, the species name. Um, like Calicordis opisboensis, it has no subspecies, it has no variety, because it's the only place you can find it is one location in San Luis Obispo. Um, right, and there are a number of Erisimum capitatum varieties, I think. Right. And so depending on, because if the variety in different locations are really different from all the other locations, then they can apply a new name to that, that species. Right. But like there's a Rissimum capitatum lompocensis. Right. If it's too similar, you've got the lumpers and the splitters. And at one stage, there was a lot of lumping. Now there's a lot of splitting. So it keeps like an accordion it goes in and out, in and out. It's like, uh, I mean, we're, we're getting old where it's like, forget it. We're not going to go, <laughs> forget remembering the names. It, you know, let's go to the common names because they don't, they rarely change. But so, anyway. Yeah. yeah so we were talking a little bit about um, where to find keys. And uh, I see you've got some stuff listed here. But, um, right. you know, the Jepson E. flora is a major reference here. It has all the keys for the state. And if that's a lot, there are also a lot of regional books that have smaller amounts, smaller selections of 
of plant yeah. fat. So well, here, I have an exercise here. This is the second line here. It's a quiz you can all do by yourself. You can print it out and and key out. See if you remember what I've taught today. Give yourself a grade. <laughs> That's fun. Um, if you've got kids or grandkids or whatever, you could do it with them. <laughs> Now how to get out of this side. Let me get out of that. Right. So, oops. Well, so many. And then there's resources, um, plant families listed here from um, from the from um, what's that? Button in a day, and that's Jepson manual and citations and all that stuff. And I want to thank you everybody for having the patience to. Um, walk through this intense i find it very intense and gnarly little exercise i hope everybody enjoyed it and i'm glad this is recorded and you can play it over and over again and hopefully you learn learn something from this and i hope you have a happy botany um trips and start getting hand lens and look at stuff start looking things in your garden see what you have all right I think I'm Thanks, good. Steve. I think we've been oh. working. Go ahead. And don't, don't forget to join and support CNPS. Remember, here are the links. That's the org, uh, cnps.org, and here's the membership. Please join us. Thank you. Uh, Great. Stop. And we're always looking for volunteers in the chapter, too. Um, right. So uh, one question is, like, so if in a typical King with Natives class, say we get back to that in our regular Friday evening classes, how does that work? If somebody brings in, where do they start? They bring in a flower from their garden. How do you and Joe and everybody start going through it? So I'm going to let Joe speak. Is Joe still around? I don't know. Um, <laughs> He's the head of Key with Native. I'm here just to yeah. slip in the classes. I see, some, I see some of your cohorts are here, but I don't see Joe right now. So I've, I've been to a couple of classes and I think, um, I think Joe sends an email out. They have a group email or something. They said, mm -hmm. maybe we'll key this this time, or I'm not too sure. Mm -hmm. um, or you can just bring a sample in if you're curious or you have some mystery plant that you want to find out. Vivian, do you know, have you been to any of the keying native? Um... Yeah, I went to quite a few actually tore, uh, before the pandemic. So there were, <laughs> Joe sometimes sends out a notice ahead of time if he's going to focus on something. Like I think, one of the last ones before the pandemic started was one on um, looking at conifers with cones and there, that one was really fun. Uh, but people also bring in things from their home gardens or something, you know, they might've found on the side of the road, everything always legal, permitted, and nothing. Um, don't, don't pick things out in the wild and bring them in. That's a big no-no. Um, only bring in things um, that you have the right to collect. Uh, but the, if you have something like that and you bring it in, and want help with it, that's something yeah. that can happen during keying. Um, yeah, take pictures. And also when you take a picture, if you do INAT, it's pretty accurate. I'm just I'm just shocked at the the accuracy um, of, of the, the identification it comes out with. I mean, wow. But we should learn how to key and not just skip to INAT. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We need that's to learn right. our parts. Right. But yeah, anyways, I mean, yeah, people send me these non-native stuff. I was like, what the heck is that? <laughs> it's not just good either. <laughs> so I do know anyways. that Joe said that he was hoping to restart when we could go indoors again. And we're getting closer. I mean, but Santa Clara still has the mask mandate indoors. So it's going to still be a little bit while, but maybe before the end of the year, we'll be able to start having king sessions again. Right. That'd be great. Um, it's more always more fun to be in a workshop together. And I think a lot of people from other chapters should also check with your chapter because I know, I think Santa Cruz chapter and Yerba Buena, I think a lot of other chapters do um, or have done in the past and hopefully we'll resume soon doing keying sessions before like programs and things. So um, look for those if you're not in the Santa Clara Valley chapter. So, well, thank you, Dee. I think we got most of the oh. questions. Oh, good. Wow. Almost, 
under an hour. Wow. Oh, no, wait a minute. It's two, two hours. hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. And I yeah, try to. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So, yeah, I mean, if we still got any questions or discussion. I'm happy to stay on a bit. No, okay. I, I uh, Ron yeah. wants to know how you learn to pronounce the names. Oh, carefully. <laughs> I don't. Um, oh, Google, you know, you, you Google highlight it and, and, and click speech and it kind of has this funky uh, robotic kind of enunciation. You kind of like, it's apparently there is actually a, a taxonomical linguistic class that one takes if you're in taxonomy or botany, there is a class you have to take. Mm. Um, hey, um, I see people are starting to drop off and just before ever, other people leave I just wanted to let remind everybody they can you can keep a copy of the chat by going down to the bottom where there's a dot 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 um so um, on my screen it's a, <laughs> to the bottom right but if you look it uh and then if you click the dot 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 it'll say safe chat so you can keep a copy since there's so many interesting references in chat so if you want to do that and Dee, I also see you have a question from Carrie Olson about showing um, on the rose photo where the hypanthemum is. Uh huh. What about it? I oh, would like you to show where it is. If yeah. you can pull up that photo again. Oh, okay. Let me. Uh... Do do do. Uh, you mean that? That picture. That these are the hypanthemum, or. Click on the, the leaf one there. I think it might be on there. Yeah. I pinned him. You know, Carrie, if you want to unmute and let us know when. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm... I, I, I don't know. As part of my question was that um, I had been keying today roses and it keeps referring to the hypanthium and I don't. I don't see it. So if you Google hypanthium, it's actually the per, uh, it's the part that swells up. It's actually the, to make it difficult for the layman, it's actually this. It's oh. the swell. Yeah, it's the fruit. Um, it's, the, it's the spongy part of the fruit. But it was referring oh. to something in the flower I thought yeah so when it's not ripen it's just the ovary it's the spongy part surrounding the ovary it's it's like in that is it the apple when it, you're eating the hypanthium is that what it is apple let's let's see Mesocarp. part yeah that's a I fancy the tissue that once held the sepals, petals, and the stamens together becomes the part we eat. So it's the, it's the part that you eat. It's in the apple, it's the part you eat. That's the hypanthum. That's before it swells up, before it becomes a fruit. And on the rose, it's the hip? Or... Yeah, the hip. Yeah. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, yeah, if you Google Hypanthium, it, it, there's a ton of stuff. You get more confused. <laughs> but, yeah, that's part of the exploration of understanding all this. Stuff. And just to let everybody know, um, the, um, the Jepson Manual is starting to not be as technical as it used to be. So those, they're using more common vocabularies. Um, Rod has another question. He We talked before about um, how to pronounce the names. Now he'd like to know when the names change. Is there one place you look at? I suggested Jepson is usually good for California, but if you go to iNaturalist, they use a global database, so it can be different. But um, the, I'll, I, I'll let you explain it. Um, oh. Well, you explained it pretty well. I mean, you hear people do paper. They write scientific paper to, to suggest a name change. 
And if you're in that realm and you get the notification of the paper, then you would know. But usually, when that gets approved or gets all, uh, yeah, gets approved, and Jepson publishes on their update. Um, let me see if I can share. That's only once a year, usually around now. I just yeah, it, it's not that. often. So if you really want to, you you probably have to subscribe to. Um, what is it? subscribe and after to that, Cal Flora will pick that up later. So there'll be the changes once they come out through Jepson. But um, but yeah, you'll see publications for new names in, in journals like Madronio from California Botanical Society and stuff. But a lot of other journals also publish name changes. So and you can find it here in the Jepson recent major updates. And here are all the summary and they date it. And I'll click on the latest one. It tells you what family has been updated and what within the family, what was updated. So it goes on and on and on. <laughs> it's like relearning some stuff. Yeah. So a lot of the Baraginaceae family has, I don't know what they've done. Water leaf, gone to the water leaf. Hydrophilaceae, some, not all, some. Yeah, it makes pretty interesting stormy weather reading, if we ever get stormy <laughs> That sounds good. Yeah. Anyway. All right, that your question, Ron. Yeah. He's on YouTube. Uh, so. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Is there any more new chats? No. All right, I'll see. Again. Glad we, I'm glad we circled back to the Hypantheum because that's one we missed earlier. Yeah, um, there's just so many, so many, so many terminologies and little specs. And wait until you do physiology within <laughs> when you have to deal with APT, ATP, or whatever you call the energy <laughs> converting for the synthesis. Right. Oh my god, I'm not teaching that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, folks, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dee. Thank you, Judy. Hope to see you. And Sorry. I'm going to be ending the session now. Thanks, everybody, right. for coming. Check our Bye. website to meet up for our next event. Good night.